So this video is a follow-up video to the video on the density of the rationals in the reals. So we're now going to look at the fact that the irrationals are also dense inside the real numbers. And the way we're going to prove this is using many of the same strategies as we used in the video to prove that it's the case for the rationals. So firstly, let's state explicitly what this means. So the irrationals being dense in the reals means that if you take any two distinct real numbers, then you can always find an irrational number in between them, just as it was the case that you could always find a rational number in between them. So if these two real numbers are distinct, then one is going to be smaller than the other, we'll call that the x11, and the bigger one we'll call x2. Then this property is telling us that there will always exist a real number r in between the two that is not a rational number, so there's always an irrational in between them. That is what is meant by the density property of the irrationals within the reals. And as I say in the previous video, we showed that this is also true for the rationals. So take any two distinct real numbers, there's always a rational real number in between the two as well. So density holds true for both the rationals and the irrationals. So let's now prove this. So we'll split it into cases. The first case we'll take is let's let x1 itself be an irrational real number. And now I don't actually need to split the two possible cases for x2. So you might be expecting me to say, oh, we need to split it into the two cases that x2 is a rational and x2 is an irrational. I don't actually need to bother. It doesn't matter whether x2 is rational or irrational. This strategy will work to produce me an irrational number between the two in both those cases. So we just are going to have the assumption that x1 is not a rational real number. The way we can find our r is we can then consider things of the form x1 plus 1 over n, where n is a positive integer, so a natural number. Now, by the Archimedean property, if I make n big enough, I'm guaranteed to eventually get something that's inside this interval from x1 to x2, because of course this interval has some finite real number length. It's got length x2 minus x1, and if I make this n big enough, eventually it will 1 over m will be smaller than this length, and therefore my x1 plus 1 over m will be inside here. Formally, that's by the Archimedean property. Now, this is going to be an irrational number because x1 is an irrational number. Suppose for a moment, so to prove that, I can suppose for the purpose of contradiction that this was a rational number. So that would mean that this was equal to some q, where q is a rational number. What I could then do is subtract 1 over n from both sides, so I get that x1 is equal to q minus 1 over n. But here we have a rational number. This is a rational number. 1 over a positive integer is a rational number. When you subtract q, 1 over n from q, that's an algebraic operation on two rationals, so you'll still have a rational number. So it would therefore mean that x1 was a rational number, which is a contradiction because we assumed x1 was not a rational number. So therefore, this cannot be true. Putter is not an element in through there. It's not equal to this q that's irrational. So x1 plus 1 over n is always going to be an irrational number. So hence, there's my irrational number in between the two. Now, the same argument happens for if x2 is an irrational number. So let's say this one is now an irrational number. This one might now be rational, but if this one's irrational, I can use pretty much the same argument to find an irrational that's in between the two. So this time, I'll just have to subtract off something of the form 1 over n. So I don't know why I've put xn there. That's not what I intended to write. So x2 minus 1 over n. So again, if I make n big enough, this thing is going to be guaranteed to be inside this interval. So it's x2 minus this bit, this 1 over n, which is a positive number. So we're going to go down, i.e. to the left here, by subtracting this off. But if you make this small enough, such that if you make n big enough, such that 1 over n is now smaller than the length of this interval, then x2 minus 1 over n will be properly contained between the two. And again, this is guaranteed to be an irrational number 
by exactly the same proof as we had here, proof by contradiction. If it was a rational number, then we could just add 1 over n to both sides, so we get q plus 1 over n this time, x2 is equal to q plus 1 over n. I'll write that down. x2 is equal to q plus 1 over n. And now q is a rational number, 1 over n is a rational number, so that would mean that x2 is a rational number, which is a contradiction because we assume that x2 was an irrational number. So for all of these cases where if x1 is an irrational number or if x2 is an irrational number or if both of them are irrational numbers, for the, all of those cases, we can find you an irrational number in between the two. I mean, if both of them are irrational numbers, you can either do this from either end. The proof will work from either end. We just now have the case where neither of them are irrational numbers. So if they're both rational. So let's now do this final case. So x1 and x2 are now both going to be rational numbers. So how can we do this? Well, we can do this with the help of the square root of 2. So the square root of 2 is roughly equal to 1.41. So if you divide it by 2, you're going to get something that's around 0 0.7. So something that's greater than 0, still positive, but strictly less than 1. Now, how can we use this? Well, what we can do is we could consider the number x1 plus the square root of 2 times 2 times the length of our interval, so x2 minus x1. Look at this thing here. So you take x1, and then if you were to add up Imagine this bit's gone. Scratch this bit out. If you were to just add on x2 minus x1, that's the length of the interval. So you'd add on the length of the interval and you'd get to x2. But we've put in this constant here that's something that's between 0 and 1. So it's going to produce a fraction of this length. It's going to shorten this length. So it means that you're going to end up with about 0 0.7 times that length. So you're going to end up somewhere strictly in between the two. This thing is going to therefore be in between x1 and x2, and my claim is that it's going to be an irrational number. And again, we can do that by proof by contradiction. So suppose for the purpose of contradiction that it was a rational number, so we could call it q. Well, now what we can do is just rearrange it and get the fact that the square root of 2 must therefore be irrational. So let's subtract x1 from both sides. So we get the square root of 2 over 2 times x2 minus x1 is equal to q minus x1. Now let's multiply by 2 and divide through by x2 minus x1. x2 minus x1 is not equal to 0, so it will have a multiplicative inverse. So the square root of 2 is equal to 2 times q minus x1 divided by x2 minus x1. Now we know that x1 and x2 are both rationals. That was our starting assumption here. So you've got a rational minus another rational, that's a rational. You're multiplying it by 2, that's another rational. And then you're dividing it by x2 minus x1, which is a rational. So a rational divided by a rational is another rational. This is all just algebra, so this is going to be a rational. So you therefore get that the square root of 2 is a rational if this thing was a rational, which of course it's not. So this cannot have been true. This thing here, x1 plus the square root of 2 over 2 times x2 minus x1, this is not an element of the rational numbers, it's an irrational number, and hence I have found you an irrational number that is between x1 and x2. So that is the proof then that the irrational numbers are dense inside the reals.